Recall that the SR flip-flop is the basic unit of register memory. It's one bit. A JK flip-flop is an upgrade to the SR flip-flop. In the SR flip-flop, the 1 and 1 input both high, S and R both high, is invalid. But in a JK flip-flop, putting both high will flip it, will toggle it. A T flip-flop, T for toggle, is just a JK flip-flop where both inputs are permanently high. The only thing it can do is toggle. So if you have a JK flip-flop, don't worry about edge triggering and all that stuff. It depends on the flip-flop. You just wire it up how you want. You can do positive edge triggering, negative edge triggering. You could do a master-slave setup. But the core unit is the same. So if you were to take a high signal and lock them into J and K, then your Q would be high, low, high, low every time you toggled the thing. Every time the clock comes in, it just flips. The initial value, it'll be a random one. When you turn it on, the quantum mechanical effects will pick high or low. It'll settle because it's a bistable multivibrator. But you can initialize it. You might just have another pin. You could have an extra pin to J or K. Usually these are called preset and clear. A lot of integrated circuits that are flip-flops have preset and clear that allow you to manually and specifically set high or low in addition to the normal input. So at boot up of your device or when you turn on the clock or at some specified time, you could just initialize the flip-flop to a specific value and then it can toggle from there. But if you really think about it, the clock becomes the input. The clock is the only thing you can now change from the outside. You choose when it toggles. It toggles, but you choose when. This has two applications. One of them is sort of as a digital flip switch, or a digital toggle switch, really. Like if you press a power button and it goes on, off, on, off every time you press it, this is the digital version of that, where you can have a physical button connected to clock, which would also be enable. When the user presses that button, it flips the T flip-flop, and now you've got a constant signal that your circuit can use to tell whether the user wants the button on or off. The other thing it's useful for is a frequency divider. Let's assume the clock is currently low. So here's clock, the clock is currently low. And here is our T output. Well, we'll just say Q since that's the actual output. Q is the actual output signal of the T flip-flop. And let's say we initialize it to low. We're starting the clock low, we initialize that to low, and here we go. So the clock goes high. Let's say this is rising edge triggered. So the clock is on its rising edge, so Q toggles. And now it's high. The clock goes low, but it's rising edge triggered, so now nothing happens. So it stays high. Now the clock goes high again. Rising edge triggered, so now it toggles. Now it's low. Clock goes low. That stays low. Clock goes high, high back low, stays high, and you can see a pattern here. This is how it works as a frequency divider. You have your clock signal. You can feed it into this flip-flop, and what you have is a clock signal at half the frequency. So it'll stay on for one cycle, it'll stay off for one cycle, and there you go. So if you have a one kilohertz clock chip that works for most of your system, but this part of your system needs to be half that speed, or this part of your system needs to be a quarter of that speed, then you can use these and you just get another clock signal. And there will be a propagation delay, obviously, as it goes through the flip-flop so you have to use some other method to coordinate between the different parts of your system. There's a billion ways to do that, of course, but very basically this is a frequency divider. And of course, if you wanted to use it as a push button, then what you would do is you'd combine multiple of the things we've done. First, you would have a pull-down resistor with the physical button connected to high. So normally it's low when the user presses the button, it's high. So you treat that as a single pulse. You put that into a debounce. You can use a Schmidt trigger, which we haven't gone over yet. You can use other things, but basically you debounce it so that the physical aspect of the switch, you don't get multiple signals, you just get one signal. So once you've debounced it and you have a nice clean high, then you put it into the pulse detector. Recall the monostable multivibrator where you can, the first one, where you, uh, the one with the NAND gates, you press the signal, you activate the multivibrator, and it will stay high for a certain amount of time and then go low even if you're still hitting the button. So using that circuit, I believe I called the video NAND gate a monostable multivibrator or something, but it's the one that goes back to high even if you keep pressing the button. 
and then you can feed that, so you have a nice clean pulse, you can feed that into your T flip-flop and the output is your result. And if you use the T flip-flop in the master-slave arrangement, which is basically just the T flip-flop and an SR flip-flop together, you can omit the pulse detector. You still need to debounce it, but that's easy. But then you use the master-slave, so when the signal comes in, it'll toggle internally, but you have to let go for it to actually finish. So that way, it doesn't matter how long they hold the button, you're only going to get one switch. So that's a great way to do a nice digital, tactile push button switch. You could even combine it with the Darlington transistor to make it a touch thing. You know, using the Darlington transistor to detect the capacitance of a human fingertip. There you go. So then you just, you just hook your Darlington transistor up to the physical spot. When they touch it, they connect across the transistor and all you have to do is draw a little line to say touch here. So all of that functionality just by tying inputs together. Pretty cool. Eh, but that's about all. So I'll be seeing you.